Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this World Childless Week webinar. My name is Christina Archetti. I'm a researcher and I'm a proud ambassador of World Childless Week. Today, we're going to discuss uh, the value of doing research about involuntary childlessness from an involuntary childless perspective. In other words, what insights do we bring uh, as researchers uh, for having lived uh, ourselves uh, the experience of involuntary childlessness? So let me introduce uh, um, our wonderful panelists. So I'm going to start uh, from, uh, uh, this is a random order, from uh, Laura Curtis, uh, who's joining us from Canada. Laura is about to defend her doctoral thesis in the music education program at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, since 2004, she has been a private voice, piano and music theory teacher. She's a music director of the Addison Women Choir in Cambridge, Ontario, and a member of the Advocacy Committee of Choral Canada. She facilitates two groups uh, on Meetup uh, for Childless Individuals in Ontario, and most recently founded the, the Involuntary Childless Researchers Facebook group. And in fact, I want uh, to thank so much uh, Laura for doing this, because uh, uh, when it came to organizing, to organizing this webinar, so there are many researchers who do research on involuntary childless and so there, and uh, it was possible just to pop a question, hey, shall we organize uh, a webinar at World Childless Week? And here we have the panelists. So thank you, Laura, for that. I'm moving on to Nisa Daru. Uh, she has a background in child welfare operations, counseling and financial management. She currently works uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services. She holds a Doctor of Education in Community Care and Counseling with an emphasis in marriage and family. She's also a certified public accountant. Nisa has been a mentor and counselor to many women struggling with issues uh, such as uh, self-esteem, self-care and creating healthy boundaries. Her doctoral dissertation was about the disenfranchised grief of involuntary childless women. Further on, uh, we are moving to Australia and uh, Sarah Roberts. Sarah is a World Childless Week ambassador for the Asia Pacific region and founder of The Empty Cradle. Uh, she's now completing an MA of social work specializing in the transition to permanent involuntary childlessness. Sarah's applied community-based research began years ago as a counselor and community worker with, ch with children and young people. Robin Hadley from the UK. Robin is a leading expert on the psychological and sociological impact of male childlessness across the life course. He's the author of the book, How is a Man Supposed to be a Man? Male Childlessness, a Life Course Disrupted. He is from Old Trafford, Manchester, and his previous careers include a counselor, deputy technician manager, scientific photographer, and kitchen assistant. It was his training as counselor and his desperately wanting to be a dad that led him to research the desire for fatherhood through his MA, MSc, and PhD. Uh, his research has been widely published, and Robin is a founding member of the campaign group Aging Without Children. I have uh, the awkward role, uh, dual role of facilitator and panelist. And so I'm Christina Archetti. I'm based in Norway. I'm a professor of political communication and journalism at the University of Oslo. I wrote uh, Childlessness in the Age of Communication, Deconstructing Silence, um, which you can read online for free. Google the title and get it open access. Uh, I'm also a psychotherapist uh, specialized in the trauma of infertility. Um, and the founder of the first Norwegian organization for the permanently childless. Uh, I'm working on my next book, The Trauma of Infertility, Understanding the Experience of Involuntary Childlessness. Okay, we are done with our bios, so I'm sure our audience uh, is wishing to hear um, our perspectives uh, as uh, researchers. So what uh, some find a bit strange is the very personal connection that we have uh, to our research topic. Because uh, a researcher is supposed to be neutral, uh, supposed to be objective somehow. And so we directly challenge that. Uh, we have uh, often deeply felt motivations for doing our research. So I would like to ask our panelists, uh, how have you come to researching involuntary childlessness? And what is your motivation for doing that? Any Who takes? Start? <laughs> Go first. <laughs> Go ahead, Laura. Uh, no, no, Nisa, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. So 
as an involuntary childless woman, before learning that there was actually a, a community of people that I could connect with, it was very lonely, very isolating, and just um very hard to you know express myself, find language, find words, and just to find you know how do I get through this journey, or you know how do I find community, how do I you know get to a place of being healthy? Because it was a lot of depression, just feeling bad about stuff, just feeling not not valued, not good enough. And it was a lot going on. And I thought to myself, you know, after I did my master's, if I ever did a doctoral degree, I'm going to write about involuntary childlessness. I don't know how, I don't know what, you know, how I would go about it, but I just know that that's what I would write about. And so when I happened up on Katie's group, Childless Collective, and I attended that first year's summit, and it was very emotional for me because I was just, it, the grief was very raw and I was just crying a lot and it was just crazy. But I was also in the process of writing my dissertation and, and I thought to myself, wow, I can't do this. It's just too hard. But can I tell you something? Doing my dissertation and getting to the end of it was, it was hard, but it was also very healing. And a big part of it was just meeting all the women who were just like, thank you for seeing us. Thank you for doing this. And I said to them, thank you for seeing me, you know, because I saw myself in them and in their stories. So that was my motivation to get my story out there and to get others stories out there too, to let people know that we are worthy, we are valued, and we do not have children, but we have a place in society. Mm, yeah. Uh, certainly the same, very similar in terms of, for me, the, the notion of healing through doing the research. When I um, was just uh, two years beyond uh, final unsuccessful fertility treatments, I decided to get a undergraduate degree, which I had always wanted, uh, but in, in music performance. And I had no, in, like, no desire to do research had I just wanted to get this undergraduate Bachelor of Music degree. And so uh, while I was there at McMaster University in Hamilton, in my final year, I was doing a course on <clears throat> on vocal pedagogy as uh, so of teaching of voice and something came up that I had never thought about, which is the connection between sex hormones, female sex hormones and, and the singing voice, uh, which may sound odd to anybody who obviously may not know anything about that with singing um, things like the menstrual cycle uh, birth control pills menopause can have effects on the voice like physiological effects and i found as i was I, i've always had this big light bulb moment that i'll never forget sitting in a library going through i had written all my notes for this um, i was doing an independent study on this going through all my notes and I had pages and pages of the impact of of, of sex hormones on the voice and you know looking at um, puberty and and menstrual cycle and menopause and I'd titled a page fertility treatments because I had done fertility treatments and as a singer and voice teacher I'd noticed an impact and as I turned through this binder it was late at night in the library and all of a sudden I came to the page that said fertility the impact of fertility treatments and it was empty and I just this light bulb went off and I thought wow like I can't believe nothing's been done on this and, and thought like hundreds and thousands of research projects have been done on sex hormones and the voice, but nothing on uh, fertility treatments. And so that is what first sparked this notion that, wow, I could maybe do research. So I did a very uh, small research project um, through a scholarship that I was awarded at the end of my undergraduate degree. And that was on, um, it was just a, an anonymous online survey that I put out throughout Ontario to singers and choral directors saying, you know, I'd like, let's see how many of these women in these fields of singing have participated. And it turned out that 18 and a half percent of the 142 women who uh responded to my to my survey had done fertility treatments and of that they had noticed particular um you know emotional psychological physiological impacts so from there i i decided to do a master's degree to to start looking more into it but then i kind of took a more sociological route and started looking at singer identity musical identity and how it ties in with it with being uh, a childless woman um just sort of the notion of performativity and and how that kind of all blended together performing uh, gender, for example, and how childlessness um, can really challenge that. And then from there, did my PhD. And so that's how I got into doing research.
I just want to say thank you. It's so lovely to be here. Um, and as I'm in Australia, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I live um, and work. Um, I'm a postgraduate social work student and my particular area of interest is childlessness grief. And I guess what really brought me into um, the research work is um, lived experience. It really was, first of all, I, I didn't understand why motherhood was so deeply important to me and I really wondered about that and then the loss of motherhood and why it affected me so profoundly and I guess why it was so invisible to the people around me. Um, and then when I sought help uh, from, um, I reached out to, to a number of counsellors and therapists and the kind of comments that we experience in, um, in social spaces were made to me in the therapy room. And um, I guess because of my professional background, I really kind of went, look, this is because we don't exist in the textbooks like like the particularly psychology is very um you know it's very research based it's very evidence based often the work um and you know when you look at for example developmental psychology like they they basically is we just are completely deleted out of the second half of life um there's no normative developmental trajectory or pathway that's been explored which is the, the involuntary childless experience and we have existed forever like there's always we've always existed in across all human communities and societies and so I guess where that led me was was really to some really deep burning questions um, and uh, I also realized that some of the comments that were made to me from people within the academic space so for example um, comments around things like you know I can't see that that people have lost more than their own expectations or this is just a white middle class, you know, entitled white middle class people who who weren't able to be successful in IVF. These kinds of comments were made from me within the academy and I just went, ooh, there's a need for us to be in there to actually affect change. Um, part of the reason I guess I chose social work is that there is such a solid background of lived experience um, researchers uh, across things like mental health, disability, LGBTQI, uh, diversity in terms of culture and gender. That was, it's always been a really important piece of the social work frame and also the blend of the individual with the sociological contextual. So that's why I really went down that path. So it's a bit of a snapshot of me. Thank you. Hi. Uh Thanks for organising this and putting it all together, and for it's an honour to be in this this panel. Um, and just while I've been listening to you guys, just been making a uh, a few things that have come across, and that's like living the grief, the grief, uh, framing the loss, and structuring the void, healing, uh, nothing, the absence of evidence, the absence of evidence of uh, essence and not being and something missing. And uh, I came into looking at, at this because in my mid forties changed career because of lots of uh, things, economics and outsourcing and my job was going and starting counseling uh, because you could do counseling qualifications in tiny blocks of uh, weeks and months. And I, I'm a working class lad. I didn't have very much confidence at all in my educational ability. And by doing those short blocks, I just thought, well, you know, I'll fail this and I'll be fine. And then I kept not failing. Uh, so I failed to fail, which is a lovely circular thing, I guess. Uh, that's just occurred to me. And so I did a postgraduate diploma in counselling and then there was an option to do an MA. And I was really scared about doing that or, like I'm a working class like I shouldn't be here I shouldn't be doing this but you know I did and because it was counseling it had to be something you experience and I just remember being really broody in my 30s and being out of sync with uh, the people around me and jealous absolutely terribly jealous of a particular colleague who became a dad and I couldn't face him I had avoid him uh, and we did have a chat and uh 
he said, what's up? And I went, you're, you're everything I should be. Um, and so that came back to me. So I looked then at uh, many wanted to be dads. I didn't become them. And found really there was nothing there about men's experience uh, around it. A lot around uh, ARTs and IVF and an awful lot around motherhood, a little bit around fatherhood. But compared to the, the vast work on women at all stages concerning reproduction, scientific and personal and experiential, um, there's really nothing on men. And so I uh, looked then after getting the MA to look look at this thing about uh, broodiness that women are uh, broody and men aren't bothered. And actually where the science was on that, and as Sarah was saying, there was no science really, although it's repeated often. Where's the evidence uh, for this? And I did my own little survey and found it was run about the same, which is sort of logical really, because if any species, whether there's a male and female, and neither were that bothered about reproducing, they wouldn't reproduce. <laughs> um, maybe I'm being a bit simplistic there, but it occurs to me like that. And then I got a, a PhD, uh, offer of doing a PhD at Keel, uh, looking at older men, uh, childless older men, because it just came through that uh, faculty of uh, gerontology. And so that's how I got my... Uh, PhD but I think one of the common things that came through was that thing of something missing for the men and Sarah picked up no narrative lack of narrative uh, lack of things to draw on so that absence of essence and like your essence is there but where is it reflected from and and two what do you frame your life uh, with when you on the arc of life, the ideal arc of life that we're given, and we're not there on the arc. We can see the arc, and we can see the distance between ourselves and the arc. Um, so I think I've spun off there, so I'm going to shut up now. That's how I came to do what we're doing. Thank you, Robin. And uh, I'll share briefly also my, my experience of getting into childlessness. Uh, well, my background is in politics and then communication. I had done my MA, my PhD, all that. Uh, but I was in the middle of the crisis of infertility. So as a result of unexplained infertility and failed IVF, my life was uh, falling apart. And doing research was for me a way to try and uh, you, you mentioned structuring the void. So that was exactly what the research was doing for me at that point. And uh, when I started to uh, do my reading about the topic, as you do, uh, I realized that there was a lot of research that was demographic in nature, that was about the, that was medical, and all of it was full of numbers, 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 and numbers. And, uh, and this had absolutely nothing about uh, the experience of uh, what it means and how it feels to be involuntary childless. And so I thought, I'm going to write about this. And at the beginning, I didn't know it would be a book. I didn't know whether it would be published at all. But I also knew that I needed a different language and uh, that I couldn't use numbers because uh, they were really annihilating our experience. And uh, for me, um, yeah, that's uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, in very much uh, what uh, what language do you use to convey uh, the emotion and to convey the depth of uh, the existential issues really that childlessness involves and um yeah and also being a communication researcher i was also interested in why there is so much silence when we are so many <laughs> and uh yes and the issues uh that we go through have a consequence on the whole of life and so yeah these were my um yeah, my reason for getting into research. But moving on, um, again, I received many times uh, this question by people who said, who say, oh, but um, you're not really objective because you're studying the same group you're part of. Well, to which first I reply, well, who is objective? <laughs> Even when you do a survey, you are deciding the, the questions. I mean, uh, we, we can never be um, objective for the fact that we are human beings. But what value do we bring us for the fact that we have lived through the experience ourselves? So I'd love to start with this, if that's okay. 
um, because when I first began my um, graduate study, so my master's degree seven years ago, um, I came to research as what's called a very positive, from a, a positivist standpoint, whereby objectivity and you know, what's valid research, and I, I had these this notion that yes i would have to bracket myself everyone should bracket themselves out of the research it shouldn't you know you shouldn't have any kind of connection and then i took some um courses in women's studies and in particular one that was a feminist uh, research methodologies course and it absolutely changed my life and it changed how i do research and i'd like to just read a quote from a an article that i read by a canadian researcher named iona sky and uh sky says this through this journey of epistemological wrestling, I think deeply about the reasons behind my research topic and my own conditioning. My lived experience has created my worldview, bringing me to this place and this topic area. No, I'm not a disinterested and neutral researcher. This topic resonates with and relates to me as deeply as it does to the potential participants. And that that quote from Sky just it it's something I've actually quoted many times in many of um, conference presentations that I've done because it's so it's exactly how I feel about doing research. So I my research I take a feminist approach to research, whereby I acknowledge and critique my role in the research and the way that my experience actually informs the research and that there is no way of getting around that or out of that you I cannot I cannot separate myself from the research and I I don't want to and my personal opinion is that I shouldn't um particularly given the sensitive nature of doing research with the child is not by choice community um and also the sensitive nature of what it is for me to do that research personally and the emotional labor that um that i invest when i do this research both during the research process so you know doing interviews with women whose stories i have somewhat it may be a connection with that is incredibly difficult for both both myself and the women that i'm speaking with um and then also even doing webinars like this, speaking about it, um, conference presentations. I cry in almost every conference presentation that I do. And I'm okay with that because I'm human. And of course it's upsetting. It's, it's, it's not, not, not that it's so much upsetting. It's moving for mm -hmm. me. And I usually end up crying when I talk about um, the women that I work with and how amazing that they are and how amazing my experience has been with them. So, but yeah, so I, I really wanted to, thank you, Christian. I really wanted to touch. I think it's a very important, question about uh research and and how we um how in our how we ourselves are so invested in it and so a part of it i think it's really um important to address that yeah yeah laura um i can definitely um echo that that you just said because for me i felt that as an involuntary childless woman myself I'm doing my research from a, using a more informed lens. I also felt that, felt that it was more authentic and that uh, connecting with other women who are involuntary childless, I think they um, they felt free to speak with me. Their c communication with me in the interviews was just raw and unfiltered. And I'll give you an example. We were talking about you know the emotions that we often feel as involuntary childless women. And I said, um, asked one participant about, you know, her emotions and, you know, how she dealt with certain things. And she's, and I'm going to read a, a quote from what she said. She said, there was a time where if I had to go to a baby shower and go into a baby Zara store and buy a gift, I mean, I would walk in and just want to burn the place down. And that's exactly, those were the exact words that she said, I didn't take anything out. And that was just her anger coming, you know, just coming forth, just raw, unfiltered. And she just spoke as she felt. And um, there was no judgment. And um, people spoke the way they felt. If they had to have a little tears in their eyes, they had that. And it was just a very, you know, organic um, conversation. So I, I think, you know, being a voluntary childless woman myself, I think it lent itself to that where they felt comfortable enough to just be themselves, talk about their experience. And so I could create a more authentic interview and uh, and research from that. 
The other um, thing I think too is also that even the way the experience is um, is captured, and Christina spoke about that um, earlier about you know numbers, and and that's why I did qualitative because I said I need to capture the essence of experience. I don't necessarily need to do quantitative, you know, in terms of it has some narrative too, but I need to get into the experience of you know of my of my 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 community my tribe my peoples you know just to see you know how people are really feeling and i got some pushback from a member of my dissertation committee on um doing the interviews um she said well i think you're too close to this topic you need to have an external interviewer and i said no i will not have an external interviewer because when i'm in the middle of my interview and i need to ask a probe do a probe to say tell me more about this a person who has no vested interest in what I'm doing will not do that. They will probably not even be empathetic to, the, to my participants. And I'm like, no. So I had to make a very strong case to that um, instructor as to why I would not, um, you know, accept someone external to my process to be doing my interviews. And so um, it was a little bit of a struggle right there. But eventually my chair agreed with me and I was able to do it because I'm thinking to myself, what's the point of someone doing my research, for, you know, asking the questions? That's the core of my research. So I had to make the case. And I'm so glad I did because, you know, it was just a lot of emotion in the room talking with these women. And I felt that this is what I'm trying to get across. And so, I'm, you know, I need to be the person, you know, going through this process with my participants. Can I just remind our audience that if they have a question, they can uh, um, they can ask it in the Q and A um, box. Uh, I was waiting for Sarah to come in, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you want to come in, Sarah? No. Okay. I'll I'll go there. Just uh, something that uh, Nisa was uh, saying there, that when I uh, was looking for uh, participants, the guys who got in touch with all of them for my PhD, uh, started off the conversation with, are you childless? Um, or actually, are you a dad? And I'd say no. And I'd sort of prepare for this. So I had a nice little couple of sentences say no. And that's but I have done research in this. And that's why I'm really, really interested in it, because I didn't want to, the conversation to switch to me. And also, to just to establish something about having a shared experience. And maybe it's something like uh, having an unheard of shared experience that helps uh, bond uh, to get people to talk. And uh, I find men fascinating. I, I really do, because there's... Uh, such a limited uh, and almost binary social narrative around for them or very, very structured um, that quite often what they're feeling and experiencing inside isn't uh, accounted for socially uh, in a, an easy way. So they've got to do all sorts of bending and twisting to try and express themselves in a, an acceptable way. Uh, manner but one thing about doing this sort of research when when you talk about it and uh men and women but particularly women say they they tell me about their losses uh mothers and not mothers, and there's an awful lot of loss uh, uh around there i think something about uh the power of being a researcher that people uh want you or perhaps need you to listen to them and to be trusted that you're trustworthy and that you'll 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 know about that um so it's uh you know what i've forgotten what the question is because i've gone off on man so i'm going to shut up now and let sarah uh come in oh uh... I, I, I always find your your insight so insightful and I loved hearing um, Laura the epistemology of the, the, you know the knowledge that we bring is really important and I loved hearing from you Nisa about um, participants and what that means in terms of that connection and the trust and, and the way that that's built and I guess I just kind of wanted to really draw a little bit from from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research 
colleagues who 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 actually talk about the ontology of what it means to be Aboriginal. And that is about, I think it's actually about we need to get to a point where we have a fundamental understanding that our way of being in the world as an older involuntary childless person is a different way of knowing, being and doing from parenting or child-free peers. And so I think it's actually about saying what we bring is we actually bring to the, the research a lens and a perspective that is, it's it's fundamentally different and we are very much research insiders and there's certain forms of research that actually can't be done like if you're not an, a, a research insider um, and that we bring life, we bring depth, we bring breadth to um, the work and the stories that that we bring. There's other things that I think are really important around uh, the ownership of the topic that we're actually telling our stories that we are owning um the research area I I guess I also think there's a lot of room to do things like bus stereotypes and for social action um I guess the other thing I think is also around in itself just the power of research itself that the power of inquiry and asking questions and finding answers and and the rigor that an academic research lens brings to that and I remember Robin when when I first met you in 2016 I think it was in Sully Hole at the the We Are Many Nomos conference I remember you had this this beautiful way of saying you know when you do a PhD it's like a grand of sand sand on the beach um and that you talked about that you know human knowledge is this you know it's you're contributing this tiny little piece of it and I guess I kind of think well who else is doing it who is paying for it and resourcing it um and what we need is we actually need to be more of us needed to be adding our little pieces, our little nuggets, our little pieces, our grains of sand to the bre- the beach so that we're developing a really solid, uh, you know, empirical and also theoretical base to really understanding and really impacting on, on policy and culture and just general human knowledge. I just think it's, it's, it's a really significant part of the human experience and human story that needs to be told and investigated and understood. And so I just think, I think it's amazing. And and I just, I'm so excited because I I was actually just thinking as I was coming into this webinar, I just went, Oh my God, my EndNote EndNote library is going to come to life. Like I'm just so excited to be here with you. So, so thank you. Thank you. I'm just going on with the beach and our, Beach of grains of sand support people carrying on their lives as they do they, they walk a, across it. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's. I just want to. I'm sorry, Christina, because we could. Uh, Laura came in with a quote, and I've got some quotes here, but I think the big one would be from Wright Mills, where he says, "Learn to use your life experience in your intellectual work. Continue to uh, examine it and interpret it." In this end, craftsmanship is the centre of yourself and you are personally involved in every intellectual project upon which you know. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, Liz Stanley says, uh, the autobiographical eye is an inquiring, analytical, sociological agent who is concerned in constructing rather than dis- discovering social reality and sociological knowledge. The use of our eye explicitly recognises that such knowledge is contextual, situational and specific, and it will differ systematically according to the social location as a gendered, race, class, sexualised person of the particular knowledge producer. So, this, you know, I can't be separated. I'm part of the world. I can't be off planet. Well, mm. I can be, but... <laughs> What good does that do? I would like to add that to what uh, what already has been said, um, particularly um, connected to the point made by Thara about the power of research. That um, so research and science really has the power of creating the world we are in. So when something is researched, it becomes a thing. So it's on the radar. It's a 
to the point that it's even on the radar of reality at all. So if we are not in research, also we, we don't exist. And so I guess that's what we are trying to do, to place ourselves uh, on the agenda, on the research agenda as well. And this, uh, um, well, my background is in politics, so I'm very interested in the politics of it uh, and the consequences that this has on our society. And particularly how nowadays polit politicians, they want uh, to, yeah, to do things for a reason. Uh, and research is often used as a reason for doing or not doing things. And uh, if there is nothing about us uh, and we demand action, for example, when we will grow old, uh, yeah, who will be looking after us? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, an issue no politician is actually thinking about. They want to know, oh, why is this relevant? Well, if, if there is research out there, out there, then that's an argument on why this is relevant. And I remember very yeah, years ago reading that uh, it was, um, so nowadays uh, we are used to deal with the issue of gay rights. But uh, yeah, being gay was taboo and, and still is in many parts of the world. And the reason why we're able now to talk about gay rights and gay people have rights is because of some researchers are starting actually doing research about it. And so even if sometimes I feel like I'm talking to the wall, I think that we need, that's where we need to start because uh, yeah, people after us will be referring to what we're doing today to build something. So we need the, so we are just placing the bricks um, and some bricks already have been uh, placed before us. And in fact, I want to acknowledge uh, Gail Leatherby, who is not here today, but uh, whose work uh, uh, we, we have read all of us uh, and she's been a, a pioneer of uh, doing childless research from a childless perspective and and so yeah we we build on each other and so it yeah what we're doing is part of something bigger than us so for me that's also the greatest motivation feeling that i'm part of this bigger story but uh, maybe um maybe moving on I would like uh, uh, to uh, to ask uh, a new question, uh, well, a new question that uh, moves on from where we have come to, which is uh, what insight do we bring that let us move forward? So thinking about uh, going into the future. So how is uh, our researcher from a, a research and childless perspective uh, contributing to this, uh, moving us forward individually and collectively? I think for me, it's to do with the notion of just consciousness raising, mm -hmm. um, where it's not enough for me to just raise awareness of childlessness, involuntary childlessness, because I think people know that this is something, this is a, this is a life experience, that there are people out there who don't have children, who are not able to have children. But that next sort of what I would consider sort of a leveling up is actually trying to, uh, to doing the work to, to help people to acknowledge, critique and resist the dominant discourses like pronatalist discourses, for example, and and actually getting, you know, people both with children and without children, but particularly, truthfully, people without with people with children to start to look at the world in which they function and how it may be different for people without children. Um, so yeah, so consciousness raising and the ability of research to do that and uh, social justice work, just being able to actually do things that are active. Um, so where, you know, not just writing and, you know, part of the problem with academic research is it can tend to be very inaccessible um to anybody other than and i believe we have a question <clears throat> excuse me in uh, either the chat or the q a about how how can we um share our research and it it can be difficult sometimes doing academic research because it it can often not be open access obviously we can share our own stuff with you um but yeah it, it's about getting it out there to the public and doing things that are action oriented um, part of my dissertation research um, was to help um, help Helen, who's here today, uh, who runs Childless Voices Choir, to um, 
write Calm After the Storm, which is a collaborative uh, song that got written with the women that we worked with. Um, and that now has been made into a video and it's on YouTube. And so it's this way of sort of doing things that are action oriented. So participatory action research is actually a way of doing research that I used and in my dissertation. And so that sort of knowledge mobilization in an active way that brings to both the public as well as um, within academia. Okay. So when I think about insights um, with regards to my research in particular, and just um, other um, articles I've read on involuntary childlessness, um, I think that even as we talk about raising awareness and consciousness and, you know, providing education to people, that is so critical because, you know, even the counseling world, a lot of times, in many cases, grief is tied to death losses. Oftentimes, non-death losses are not seen in the context of people grieving these losses. You know, it's almost like, what are you talking about? I had one participant who she went to um, a therapist and the therapist said to her, you're here because you can't have children? Almost as if, why would you want to attend counseling because you can't have children? And this poor woman was so taken aback. She just couldn't understand why would a question like that be asked? And why would a therapist of all persons ask her that question? And she was so, you know, her grief just kind of heightened because she just could not believe that this was a question that you're going to be asking. I'm coming to you for help. And you have not taken the time to hear my story, to understand where I'm coming from, but you ask me a question like that. And she was, you know, really bothered by that and she never went for another session so I think a big piece of, of you know us creating awareness about our community is you know the counseling world really needs to have training in this area as to how best to work with um people in our community who are you know grieving non-death loss and of which you know childless grief is a part of it and just how best to work with them to help them to live you know healthier lives free of depression and anxiety and whatever other issues come along with um how they're feeling i had one woman in my study who um she became involuntary childless because at, at age 29 she had to have a hysterectomy because she had ovarian cancer and she said she had no time to think about freezing eggs or doing anything everything it was so aggressive the cancer was so aggressive she had to have the hysterectomy like right away and 24 years later, this woman is still grieving. When I interviewed her, she had tears in her eyes. I had to say to her, are you okay to go, you know, to continue? You can take a break or you can stop or you can, you know, we can we can reschedule. Just let me know what you would like to do. Because she was still emotional 24, 24 years later. So, you know, the insight is that we need to understand that this grief goes over the lifetime for some people. And some of us learn how to carry it better than others. And some people are just in a place where they have not moved or they have moved very much. So, you know, in order to, you know, have people lead healthier lives. And I mean, when one individual is not healthy, it affects society. So we need to be, and, you know, Christine talked about the politics of it all. And this is things that we need to be advocating for so that as, you know, as we age, we can be, you know, elders, you know, what Jody, the word that she does, we can be healthier in terms of how we live our lives and find ways to carry our grief because some people think that grief is something which oh you'll get over it you know it's been a long time but it doesn't work like that we learn how to carry grief not necessarily get over it and move into a different place and we learn how to have our grief and our joy coexist but it doesn't mean that we'll never have grief again or we'll never feel sadness about you know not having children so I think all these pieces just need to be so in a place where you know the education is out there and people are becoming more aware so that we can implement policies and you know and that change in our society um so th that's kind of where you know my my whole thing was with just 24 years that that's like a lifetime and to be in that same place and not to have the the structures and the help and it was it was really hard for her because she's from a latina family and in her family she was being disenfranchised because when she got married at maybe 40 her family did not congratulate her and they said well we didn't think you're going to get married you can't have kids. So why are you getting married? So you see how difficult it is even within the family structure that 
the disenfranchisement not, is not only out in the in, in the world, but it's right there with you. So so much work needs to be done. And I'm as Robin would say, I'm, I'm gonna stop now because I'll I'll just go off and just be on here for another long time. So thank you for that. I just want to say in the interest of time that, um, uh, of course, uh, feel free to to add what you wanted to add, but uh, I would like also to address some of the questions that the audience has posed. Also, I just want to warn, I received this terrifying message from my system saying, your, your system is going to reboot in five minutes. So if I drop out, I do apologize. <laughs> I'll, I'll return as soon as I can. It, uh, I, it's something I can't control. It's, it's again, it's a laptop from my institution. So that's research is still for you, things happen sometimes. Okay, um, so I don't know whether Robin or Sarah wanted to add something to this. Uh, I, I think because of the time, uh, Q&A might be a, a thing uh, to go for. Okay, so I'm, um, I, I'm not going to read the live the questions, but what I get uh, are the, the essence of these questions are, one question is about, um, are there any topics that we need to research? What are important uh, topics that we think should, uh, uh, should be investigated further? Sorry, was that to me? Uh, was that to... Uh, no, it was to, to everyone, whoever wants to answer it. I think it's a pretty broad brushstroke at this point. Yeah. It would yeah, I agree. That. Yeah. And I would say that, uh, I mean, the childless experience uh, is very much under-researched, so any angle <laughs> is welcome. I mean, anything that illuminates uh, this experience. And I see there is also a question about uh, neurodivergent, neurodiversity and the childlessness. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's also something that needs to be researched. Uh, I mean, uh, the childless, um, um, sometimes we talk about ourselves uh, with this broad term to indicate we are a community. And we don't want uh, also this uh, label to obfuscate the extreme diversity within this community. So I think we need more and more researchers to illuminate uh, all the shades uh, really of being childless. Yeah, I think it's just, it's such a complex in terms of um, a complex experience in terms of how people come to childlessness. Um, and so I think that um, there is also, I think, a question that addresses uh, like LGBTQ folks. And, um, you know, I think even when we start looking into trans folks, I think there there is just, as Christina said, like, there's been Obviously, there has been research done, and there's those pioneers like Gail Letherby, uh, Jody Day, people who are doing, and, and us who are doing this research now. But I mean, there are just there's like thousands of routes into it that we could take because there are it's so complex. I think that there are just multiple angles, and if I think for me, the reason I went through music is because that's my background, and so I think that if yeah, yeah, and because I'm such a believer in in this notion of like do the research that actually really means something to you personally, then that's how. Because I know with Nissa, <clears throat> excuse me, in your dissertation, you um take you do uh, quite a good big look at um in the church community, for example, which is part of who you are. And for me, it's through music. For Robin, it's as a man and as a man who's aging. Like so, I think taking things through your own lens is the best way. I don't know if best way is the right way to say it, but I think it can lead to m the most meaningful and impactful research is to look at. So if you're looking at, and one of our other questions in the Q&A I saw there is, you know, how do we get started as, as doing this? And I think it's find that spark, right? Let that light bulb go off and think to yourself, wow, here's a gap. And there are lots of gaps in the research in terms of childlessness and find one that speaks to you. And then from there, start to start to move forward into it. And, and write that down uh, at the very beginning. Write that down and want to do this because of this, because that will help you all the way along your research. Because it is lonely and it is confusing and it's not easy uh, and it's very, very emotional. So you, you do need to have a some support there uh, as well to just remind you why you're you're 
doing this. So for me, that reminder was that actually these men's voices are there, but uh, the microphone's switched off. Um, and why is that? There is a there is a further question uh, um, asking whether there is any research about uh, LGBTQ and other minorities and childlessness. There's a, a, a book called uh, Aging and Diversity. It's an edited volume by a lovely woman whose name has just gone past me. <laughs> um, Robin, I hear your volume is very low for some reason. There we go. It's... That's why. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, there's a, there is a book uh, around uh, uh, aging and diversity and childlessness uh definitely it's an edited volume and i'll try and find it uh for you and pop it in the the thing and i also know of the civilla morgan i can Sibylla morgan who has a podcast uh, on issues affecting uh, black uh, minorities uh, as well uh so I mean, the good thing is that there are many childless researchers out there, and I guess uh, just now we are uh, starting to to get uh, a sense of uh, who is researching on what. But there is much more that can be done, and in fact, uh, there is another um, uh, question about uh, how to become uh, a researcher. Do you have a researcher? Do you have any suggestion on how to become a researcher? Which again, it's a very broad question. <laughs> but uh, any any takers? I guess one thing is probably around, um, I think it's really ha having a level of confidence in the questions that you're asking, but also potentially finding allies. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly the super, your supervisor is a really critical piece of your, if you're doing any, any thesis based work, it's a really co critical component. And I think, you know, it's, it's a very, I, I, based on my own experience of, of going to apply for a master's degree, I met first with the chair of, of graduate studies and it was a really emotional thing for me. And I was a very, you know, vulnerability plays a massive role in being a researcher and also somebody who participates in research. <clears throat> and I think making sure that you're I guess prepared to be vulnerable in that no i mean i think most of us tend you know tend to be quite vulnerable anyway just given our circumstances but um and then making sure that the institution that you are looking at so if we're talking about doing academic research as in going through a university for example this is and that's, that's just one way of doing it um yeah checking on the um university that you're thinking about checking on the the professors that work there what their research is i mean gail lethaby i think is she at birmingham i can't remember she's at um one of a university in the uk it you know seeking out um as i said you said those allies right and particularly in the profs that might be supervising but it's also not just about that somebody has to have done research i mean my supervisor um he doesn't have any real connection to the child is not by choice community but he's fully supportive of what I'm doing because he sees value um, from different perspectives in what I'm doing, not just, but also including just value for the Child's Not My Choose community, but also just value for research in general and for the music field too, because that's what mine uh, inter intersects with. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the book is Aging, Diversity and Equality, Social Justice Perspectives by uh, Susan Westwood. Uh, and that covers a, a lot of uh, issues around childlessness and LGBTQI um, people and ageing. Uh, and also we'll link through. Uh, I think somebody said in the questions about uh, our, is the material open access? Some is. Christina's book is open access. Some isn't. If you go to my website, I, there's stuff there you can download of mine where it's possible and legal to do so. But quite often the publishers tie you up. 
But uh, I can say that uh, if anyone is interested, probably they can come in contact with us personally and we can share a draft, I'm sure, <laughs> with them informally. Um, there is a, another question. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand it correctly, but uh, it goes along the line of, uh, would you recommend to contribute to research as a public contributor? Um, I think I, I understand it as uh, coming out and speaking out for the childless. Uh, so my, my immediate reply to that uh, would say, yes, I mean, anyone who wants to speak out for the childless, please do it uh, in every way and form. We need uh, more voices out there. And at the end, uh, I think we we are a community. And so it's good uh, if we can bounce off from each other's contribution. And uh, so if you're a, if you're a journalist, uh, please write about child, childlessness as an issue. So contribute in whichever way you can from your own perspective and with your own skills. But I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to this. Uh, yeah, become an advocate um, and, and find people in of a in this in a similar community to you and uh, and share. Um, maybe that will help support you helping support others. I think social media would be at this at this particular point in time, social media is the 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 sort of yeah easiest best way to do that to connect with others in the community. There are lots and lots of Facebook pages um, going through Stephanie's <clears throat> World Childless Week website and seeing the resources and seeing all the different kinds of groups and other websites and such um, is a great way. And, and you can, you know, form. I mean, it's like when I started this researchers Facebook group it was so that I could bring we could bring people together and we can be allies together and the possibilities that opens up for working uh, moving forward even working together possibly um, on particular research projects and things but sometimes it's just coming together getting ideas and getting advice from others about for example some people on some Facebook pages have talked about contacting their HR departments in their workplace about um, you know policies um, that are more CNBC friendly for example so there's there definitely are lots of ways but it's yeah and and so coming together and, and meeting meeting people in the community that can help you i think is is a good way to start very last uh, question because i'm uh, concerned about the time is um how do we remain professional when uh, we are confronted perhaps uh, also in our workplace as a, in the academic environment with uh, maybe insensitivity towards our topic and ourselves as childless. How do we remain professional? It's a great question. Um, I think if you sort of think of it as an opportunity to educate, that, that might uh, be uh, a way, and I'm not sure about uh, the other members on the panel, but certainly I've felt uh, experienced resistance to my research in academic settings uh, as well, because you're you're raising something that's uh, different and challenging, particularly as being uh, from the, the men in a, a, a field which has uh, so much around uh, women. And it's a very sensitive subject. It's very personal. Um, so be careful take care of yourself first and um, see what's around but counseling is always good for everything mm -hmm. in my experience and i think just one more thing if that's okay um in terms of remaining professional sometimes i don't because sometimes the people who are speaking to me um as for example, a lot of my um, experiences in academic conferences, sometimes they don't deserve professional behavior from me uh, in terms of what gets said and how it gets said. And so I tend to be very, um, and it's taken a long time for me to be able to do that. I've had a lot of experiences with it where sometimes it's not about being remaining professional, but just being very honest and very truthful with with what's been said and, and what the impact of the words that have been said can have on people.
let's say also in my case, it becomes an opportunity to educate uh, the, the person who's uh, spoken out. But uh, I actually collect all these anecdotes uh, because uh, they help me understand uh, exactly what you said, Robin, how sensitive it is for other people and how sometimes uh, these comments, they come from a place of great discomfort because uh, they can't deal with this topic because it's a taboo topic. And so they come up with this uh, uh, not really thought out comments. Uh, and uh, that tells me something about the mechanisms uh, behind uh, why there is so much silence. So I try to also become aware of how these comments some, sometimes would have this silencing effect on me. And I try to counter that. So, and that again comes from my particular research interest. And yeah, I mean, it takes some effort, uh, but uh, yeah. And um, this shows uh, again how, how much um, uh, challenging actually doing this kind of research is. I see that we are uh, um, we're running out of time, so um, so I I hope uh, yeah the audience has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have, and uh, I must say uh, we would like to make this uh, a, an annual event. So hopefully there's going to be another uh, panel, another webinar next year about uh, uh, research from a childless perspective. So we have only started a conversation; we've only scratched the surface. There is so much more that we can talk about. Also, um, if you're a, a researcher or if you're interested in our research, perhaps, uh, well, contact us, but uh, join also the Facebook uh, uh, page, Involuntarily Childless Researcher, which Laura has uh, uh, founded, uh, so that we can uh, we'll all meet there and we can be a community. And um, yeah, other than that, uh, thank you so much for participating. Thank you to our wonderful panelists and uh, to next year. <laughs>